Hello, everyone, and welcome to today, today's webinar. My name is Stacey Sinclair. I'm a partner here at Fenwick Elliott, and we are delighted to be back here again with you today. Um, thank you very much for joining. We today are, of course, talking about de delay analysis, how to prove your claim successfully. And obviously, given how often we see delayed construction and infrastructure projects, a very important topic. Um, it has impact, impacts on cost and everything else, and clearly very, very timely. Um, and also clearly a very hot topic today, as we have a record-breaking number of uh, registrations and indeed um, all of you joining us today. So thank you very much. So um, no pressure to our speakers who I will introduce to you now. First, we have uh, my colleague and fellow partner, Edward Foyle. Uh, Edward uh, specializes in dispute resolution in construction and energy projects all around the world, such as offshore wind, renewables, the power sector, um, and aviation and, and port developments, uh, and many more. And joining Edward, we have uh, for you today, David Goodman. Uh, welcome, David. Uh, David is a managing director at Kroll the, in the expert services practice. He is a civil engineer by background and delay analysis with over 25 years of experience in the construction industry. David has acted as an expert witness on many occasions and has prepared numerous expert witness reports, given oral evidence, um, testimony, and provides strategic advice to solicitors uh, and counsel on various time-related issues uh, and disputes. So without further ado, I will turn over to our speakers, but just a reminder, uh, please do submit questions as we go, and we will try and take as many of them, of them as we can at the end. Everyone is on mute, and um, rest assured that a copy of these slides and an on-demand recording of this will be available on our website in due course. So, Edward, David, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, it's great to see so many attendees. I think David is the real draw for, for this <laughs> webinar. I'm delighted that he is presenting with me. Um, he's gonna be covering the, the really complicated stuff, but, but first of all, I'm gonna talk about some, some of the um, legal issues. And I, I just wanted to echo Stacey's point there that delay is the, the, the single biggest problem that we see, I think, at Fenwick Elliott with construction uh, projects. It, it just is inevitable that when you, you sign your contract, you've got a new project in place, you've got the way uh, that you intend to go about doing those works all thought through change is inevitable it always happens whether it comes from the employer or issues crop up that you you just couldn't have expected when you um set out to do the project it always happens so how, how do you deal with that and what's going to be the consequence of that well um very often obviously it leads to delay to a, a project completing and um it may also, even if it doesn't delay the actual completion of the project, which is something we're, we're going to be talking about quite a bit today, it, it can cause extra costs to, to be incurred. And as a contractor, you're, you're going to want to be able to recover those costs. So why, why is delay important? Well, as a contractor, you've got a obligation to complete the works by the date for completion stated in your contract. Uh, and if you don't, the employer is going to have the right to claim liquidated damages. And if the delays continue for a long time, the contract will likely provide the employer with a termination right as well. And I said, as I just said, really for a contractor, if you can prove that the delays are not your responsibility and that you're due an extension of time, that gets you a, a gateway to getting costs. So first of all, your 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 prolongation costs, by which I mean the costs associated with the project taking longer, um, the costs of being on site longer, those sorts of costs might follow from an extension of time. And you may also be able to cover further costs associated with the, the delays that have been caused. But delay claims are full of really tricky jargon, and um, we're going to talk through uh, and touch on what some, some of these principles that are on the screen mean. The most fundamental thing to understand is what we actually mean by delay. 
uh, and in, in this sense I'm, I'm talking about delay that affects the completion of a project and obviously the, the, the key term here which I'm sure you've heard time and again is the term critical delay um, and um, I, I, it can be easy to think well critical that means really important something's vital it's crucial that's that's not what it means it means a critical from a programming perspective and that involves looking at the, the critical path and I've, I've put a really simple definition which I, I, I hope David will agree is right that it's, it's the sequence of activities to, to completing the project it's, it's the shortest time that you can do so if a if a delay is caused to a critical activity that's going to then knock on your ability to complete the works on time because all the further critical activities will be completed uh, will, will be delayed and that will push out the completion date but by contrast um, if a activity which is not on the critical path is delayed that won't necessarily uh well, well it will not push out the completion date and because because um unless and until that activity becomes critical but if in the first instance it's not on the critical path there'll be no delay to completion there'll be no entitlement to an extension of time but there might still be costs with that particular scope of works and activity being delayed um that you could recover Another crucial another crucial term I think to understand is the nature of a disruption claim, which is which is really a different claim from um, a, a, de a delay claim. It relates to a loss of productivity, so works taking longer to be completed um, but also you're not achieving the same amount of um, productivity from your labor force or, or or your plant and equipment which means that there's there's idle time and you're 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 losing out on money that you, you should have made if you don't mind excuse me for just one moment i'm going to close a window Apologies. So, as I mentioned, liquidated damages, this is what the employer is going to be entitled to um, if the completion date is not met. The employer is entitled to these damages just as a, as a right. Um, they, they will get them uh, at, a, at the, the fixed rate that's set out in the contract. They don't need to prove why the completion date has not been met. They don't need to prove that the contractor is at any fault at all. Uh, and they don't need to prove the loss they've suffered. So if you're a contractor, you might be surprised to see that I've put on the slide that it, it's to both part, parties' benefits because it provides the both parties with certainty. Well, it does because I suppose as a contractor you're running late you know your liability is for liquidated damages and that's it because liquidated damages are unless I otherwise stated going to be the sole remedy for delays to completion so extension of time provisions well they provide uh, the circumstances in which the contractor can get a longer period so that it's going, not going to be liable to meet that completion date. That completion date can be adjusted, you work to the new date and therefore it provides relief from LDs. So you, you, you need to consider when events arise whether they are issues that fall within the ambit of your um, extension of time provision and, and therefore would entitle you to an extension of time. You, you then also need to look carefully at what that provision says about how you go about adjusting that contractual completion date. Again, EOT provisions provide both a contractor and an employer with certainty. Uh, they're, they're particularly good for an employer 
because they mean that disputes about um, the prevention principle or time being set at large don't apply. So um, the, the prevention principle is the principle that one party, you know, an employer, cannot rely on its own failing to then say, well, you, you, you haven't completed your works if the employer is responsible. That principle, provided the event is covered within the extension of time provisions, will, will not apply. So, um, and what, what, what the prevention principle would do would be to set time at large where, where an EOT mechanism has failed, or it's one way that time could be set at large. And that really is, is quite problematic for an employer because it means that the contractor has a reasonable time to complete its works, which for, 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 for which there's really no um, agreed way of determining what a reasonable time is. And in addition, the, contract, the employer will likely lose its right to liquidated damages and have to prove general damages, so prove what its actual losses are. So, in terms of the, the procedure in an extension of time provision, it, 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 almost all uh, provisions require the giving of a notice that the contractor's works are going to be delayed. And very often that is a condition precedent to an extension of time being granted. And it's obviously absolutely crucial that that is complied with because if you do not put in a notice within the specified time frame and the provision is a condition precedent, then your entitlement to an extension of time will be lost. Um, there are important provisions because the employer is kept up to date with the issues on the project and you know, may be able to take action to reduce the delays. For example, if it had issued an instruction which um, a contractor says, well, that's going to cause me to be delayed, then the employer could theoretically withdraw the instruction. Um, there's also, once you put in that initial notice, going to be uh, a requirement to progress the claim. So I've got a few of the key uh, contract provisions here, just to flick through. FIDIC requires um, a notice within 28 days of the contractor becoming aware of an event or circumstance which may result in an extension of time to completion. And then 14 days later, uh, to submit a fully detailed um, claim for, for the extension of time with supporting particulars. JCT follows a similar structure. Whenever it becomes reasonably apparent, the progress will, will be likely to be delayed. Forthwith, give a written notice. Um, and then as soon as possible thereafter, give particulars. And NEC says that it, if the contractor does not notify a compensation event within eight weeks, he is not entitled to a change to the completion date or other key dates or prices. So um, those, those, that just shows you broadly the, the requirements of, of an EAT provision. Um, any entitlement to an extension of time is always subject to the contractor's general uh, duty to mitigate the, the, the delays to the project. This is a, a general duty of common law. If you, if you have a claim, you're required to um, take steps to make sure that the loss that the owner, uh, that the other party is going to suffer is, is reduced as far as it can be. Some um, contract contracts elevate that slightly by including express obligations to mitigate, which probably go a bit further than the general position that's implied by common law. So JCT 2016, for example, has a, has a best endeavors provision, um, and they are, they are slightly more onerous than what is required um, at common law. Um, however, Keating uh, in the quote on the slide says, it is thought that this sort of provision 
uh, does not contemplate the expenditure of substantial sums of money. So uh, I think substantial is probably an important word there. You, you may have to spend some money, you may have to um, dedicate time and resource to considering the options that could be taken to reduce the delays. I think it's always important just to keep a record of why you proceeded in the way that you did, uh, whether there were mitigation steps that were considered um, and why they weren't taken, just so you have a record to cover off any later allegation that you, you failed to mitigate or reduce the delay that the, the project was suffering. Concurrent delay is, is an old chestnut that frequently comes up in um, extension of time claims, but um, you, you, you may also know that it's, it, it's actually it's very rare for a court um, to find uh, that the concurrent delay actually existed. It, it has a particular legal meaning and that is that it will only arise where there are two, two delay events, one a contractor risk, the other an employer risk that occur at the same time, and that the effect of those two events in terms of overall delay to the project are also felt at the same time. And I, I think it's just really important to, to be aware that it is rare that there will be findings of concurrent delay if your, if your dispute goes to the courts. And um, you should you should always, I think, assume that just because something happens on if you're an employer on the contractor side or if you're a contractor on the employer side that happens late, and you think, well, that's late, that they're, they're, they're you know they're delaying me. You you, you just can't assume that um, because because if you if the project is already in delay through your own fault, then that late action by the other party most likely may, may not delay the works. And I think also you only really identify what, what, the, what the causes are when, when you get a very detailed analysis when it comes to the dispute by um, an expert. So I think you, you've just always got to assume that um, you've got to be proceeding with your own works as diligently and expedition, expeditiously as you can, rather than think, oh, well, a late, late variation's been instructed, I'm going to get an extension of time for that. Um, and, and, and just to confirm the, the position under English law uh, that, that, that's fairly settled now is that a contractor will be entitled to an extension of time, but it won't be able to recover the costs if in, in any period where there's concurrent delay um, for the employer. Um, it, 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 it has to give the extension of time, so it gives up its right to liquidated damages. And that's that's the way the English courts have approached it. And, and they consider that a, a sort of fair um, outcome because each party is giving up entitlements and each party is at fault. But other jurisdictions do take a slightly different approach. So if you've got projects elsewhere in the world or, or, or rather subject to governing law, of another jurisdiction, um, that may not be the case. Um, for example, in Scotland and the UAE, a court is more likely to apportion um, the, the responsibility and the uh, costs that are incurred between the parties based really on an assessment of, I think, which is, which is more dominant and the circumstances of the case, what they feel is fair and appropriate. So how do you actually prove your entitlement to an extension of time or, or just I will comment briefly on how you prove your entitlement to, to costs as well. You'll have legal submissions, you'll, you'll be in, a, in court proceedings, arbitration or adjudication and you'll have le legal submissions prepared by lawyers which will say why the EOT provision is engaged, why you're due relief under it and an extension of time. Uh, when, when we're talking about delay, you're going to also need um, an expert 
uh, to give an opinion on the amount of delay that is attributable to each of the events that falls within the extension of time provision. And um, you'll, you'll rely on that expert's finding and you know, that, that, that will need to be done in, in a reliable way using a reliable methodology, which, which David will talk about later. But it, it's also important to remember when you're, when you're on a project, when you're doing the works, that if a dispute happens later, it's, it's really important that the contemporary documents show what, what you will later be saying were the causes of delay to the project. So there do need to be records and um, a, a judge or an arbitrator will review those records and they, they, will, they will expect there to be consistency between what those records say and what, what your expert has concluded is the cause of, of delay. So if, 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 if the programs tell a different story to, to, the, to the actual project documents, that could be an issue. Um, and this is a sort of graphic that you, you sometimes see, which just demonstrates that records as the base of a claim, those records will be introduced and explained by witnesses and then you have the, the, the further analysis and conclusion by, by the experts, which provides the sort of pinnacle for your, your entitlement in your case. So very, very briefly on costs, uh, as I said, if, you, if you've got an extension of time, there's no concurrency of delay, you should be entitled to your costs of the, the project taking longer. Um, for um, other sorts of claims like disruption claims, you really have to keep, that they're harder to, you're going to have to prove causation, why those costs were incurred uh, and that they were incurred as the result of employer issues and not contractor issues. And you're going to need to prove when they were incurred because that might, might be relevant to the findings of who, which party is responsible for delays at any particular time. So um, think about keeping records of the reasons why costs are being incurred during the project and think about how you can how you can do that. So one, act, one possible um, way of doing that might be to set up time recording cost codes for either a particular activity that is being delayed as a result of um, the other party to the contract or um, if there are particular working areas that you say are only necessary because of um, delays caused by the other party, then, then maybe you can find a way to record time in that area to, um, uh, in a particular way that can later be used reliably. Um, but very often tender costs are used as the basis for a claim for delay and disruption. So you might say, well, look, the project overall cost me double what I was, was planning and that extra amount, that's entirely due to inefficiencies that were caused by the delays. Um, if you're going to do an analysis that way, you, you, re you really need to be able to show that your tender assumptions were reasonable. So have a think about what, what you can do to show that. And one way might be to show that if you've got a period at the, pro at the beginning of the project before you're suffering delay or disruption, that you were um, proceeding in accordance with the assumptions in your tender. Um, if you don't have, it's obviously, it's very difficult to keep these sorts of records. And it's easy for me as a lawyer to say, oh, well, maybe you could consider doing this when, when you're actually in the, um, uh, just just focused on carrying out the works it, it's it's not so straightforward and it may therefore be that if, if you have a dispute all that can be done is for a witness a project manager or somebody else to say these were the issues look how many there were um, they disrupted our works we lost productivity and, and all I can say is that these individuals 
it, I, I would estimate that in this period of time, they spent a certain percentage of their time working on um, I I issues that were caused by by the employer. That's so something we sometimes see, and at least provides a way to um, for, for for a judge or arbitrator to allow some costs to be recovered. So that's that's it from me, um, and I will now hand over to David. Thanks, Ed. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me okay. Um, have I now got control? Let me just check. Yes, okay. Um, thanks, Ed. So I'm going to just run through, as it says there, um, the basics of delay analysis. Um, what is the critical path, methods of analysis, um, proving delay, the techniques that we use, and just some of the common themes. Um, some of the subjects Ed has already touched on, so based on time, um, I'll, I'll try and move through those as quickly as possible. So if we just look at the basics of delay analysis to start with, um, as we as we discussed, and as I do in my day-to-day -day job, um, I look at I look at projects that have suffered um, issues related to time, so issues relating to delay. Uh, is the contractor entitled to an extension of time? How much extension time is due? Must the contractor pay liquidated damages, i.e. it's the contractor's culpability for the delay? Or can they claim um, prolongation costs? Is there concurrent delay and how should that be treated? Um, I, I, I talk a bit further about concurrent delay later on. Um, mitigation measures, again, as Ed was speaking about, um, there is a duty to mitigate, but obviously there's there is a, um, a fine line between uh, what you are required to do in in terms of financial implications. Uh, did disruption occur, and if so, why? So again, we can have projects that are severely disrupted but actually finish on time, but have costed uh, have, have cost the contractor a great deal more money being able to finish on time. So disruption is an area that we investigate. Um, and moving on. So answering, answering those questions, we, we do critical path analysis. That's, that's my day-to-day -day job. Um, so we work out through the critical path uh, what actually happened on a project. As Ed mentioned, um, from the SCL protocol, the critical path is really uh, the sequence of activities through a project network from start to finish, the sum of whose durations determine the overall project duration. So those activities sit on the critical path. If they're delayed, then the project's going to be delayed. Um, other activities can be delayed, but not necessarily uh, causing critical delay. We call those subcritical or non-critical. Um, and it's only activities that fall on the critical path that can be considered for either an extension of time or data damages. Um, and as I said there, projects can be significantly disrupted but not delayed. So where do we start? Um, from my point of view, we start with the programme. So I've just put a little caveat at the bottom. When we look at the contract, we understand certain contracts specify um, the programming requirements vary in, in, in huge amounts of details, whilst others do not. So it's always important to understand under the contract what your programming obligations are. Most contracts uh, require the contractor to program out their works, how they're going to undertake the works, um, monitor progress, which is for us, it's key. You know, I, I do really say that the program is a is a roadmap that should be used from the start of the project to the end of the project. It, it, it tells you, you know, it gives you so much information and it should be used to monitor works. It should be used to keep progress up to date. Um, again, programs can be used and should be used to, to monitor and map delay events, new instructions, variations, extensions of times, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I've, I see everything from very, very detailed programs that 
are constantly updated, constantly monitored, um, have all of the changes inputted into them, all the way through to programs that uh, are, are very rarely updated, don't, don't capture change, don't capture variations, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the program for me is a really important tool. Uh, the objects of the program is at the start and at any point in time to determine uh, the earliest date on which completion can be achieved. And that's really important to understand at any point in time where a project's heading. And again, in, in my field, um, you know, one of the complaints is that there's no certainty on the, on the project at any point in time. Uh, the, the employer didn't really know the status of the project. So you know, a good program will always um, help you understand where you are, how you got there, and also um, where you're heading. So as I say, you know, I, I do call it the roadmap. Um, also, it's going to identify on it activities that are on the critical path. And that, for me, that's really important because that, that's your focus. So on a, on a big project, you can have you know, thousands of activities. Um, you need to know where your focus is. What, what, what are the activities that matter in relation to getting you to completion at the earliest point possible? And that's going to allow you to uh, make sure your resources are focused in the right area, make sure your actual management, your subcontractors are all, you know, you're bringing on the right subcontractors at the right time. With the whole idea is you're really focusing on this map of you know the roadmap to completion um, and that is why the critical path um, is important uh, it shows a relationship it, it kind of shows everything you need to know um, the sequence of activities site operations um, and time constraints there can be all sorts of time constraints certain public holidays certain labour available at certain um, points in time, um, we, winter shutdowns in, in very cold uh, jurisdictions where you can't pour concrete, you know, when, when the temperature drops below a certain uh, uh, level. All of this is, you know, a good programme and a, a robust programme will capture all of this type of information. And, and when we're doing our analysis, you know, one of the first things we turn to is to see how how the works were programmed at the beginning and how they were updated and how change was captured, how the critical path was identified. It, it, it really is an important tool. Um, so moving on, as I said there, uh, the, tip, the critical path is really the one thing that I spend most of my days uh, debating with, with, with opposing experts. Uh, you need to establish what changed from the planned critical path and hence what caused delay uh, and when that change occurred. So if we look at an example here, a really simple example, uh, we've got a, an as planned critical path going through a project. You can see excavation, substructure, superstructure, fit out, etc. That's our planned critical path. There's an activity there called MEP procurement. And you can see that's got float. That can be delayed by on that project or on that program there by circa two weeks before it's actually going to become critical. So at that point in time, in plan, it's not critical. When we look at the as built program, there's been an issue with the MEP procurement, and now MEP is, is critical. So at a certain point in time, an activity that was non-critical in plan has now become critical, and that helps us you know, unpack the, the analysis of this project. Why was MEP equipment delayed? We would investigate and we'd work out exactly um, when and why MEP procurement was driving the critical path. And as you can see there, when we talk about critical and non-critical delay, um, those activities there, superstructure and fit out, they were originally on the critical path, but because MEP has become so delayed, Yes, they are delayed themselves, but they are now no longer critically driving um, the project. So they become non-critical delay. So what do we need? You know, in, in my day-to-day -day role, what do I need uh, to help me get to this kind of opinion? It's, it's a, a set of very well-organized documents. We do a forensic analysis on a project. So if we look at the kind of documents 
that we're interested in identifying. Um, we look at program updates, as I said, progress reports, uh, percentage completes of activities, delay measurements, EOT, all EOT requests and delay notices. So, so we look at a whole um, raft of, of, of um, data from all over and we, we rebuild the project with, from a forensic point of view from taking all of these pieces of information and stepping our way through the project to understand what actually happened. So program updates, I've said it, you know, program updates, if they're, if they're well documented and well used, then they're, they're a very good tool for understanding what happened on a project. And they're, they're a good starting point. So as I've, as I've shown here, um, you know, we would map out every month, what was the, what was the program showing this critical? A, a good indicator as to what the parties were thinking about the project at the time, you know, what was being recorded. Um, and as you can see there, uh, it gives a status every month of what was determined to be critical at that time. Um, other, other areas, um, areas of concern, when you have a progress report, we always look at, well, what were people talking about at the time? What were they actually putting into writing um, to say that their project was suffering delay? And as I've said there, for example, in January 15, everyone started to write about the boilers being, um, boiler instrumentation being problematic, and also the cooling water system. So all the time we're gathering all this information from various sources and putting it all together into a, into a forensic kind of database of analysis. Um, as built progress curves. So again, when we monitor progress of certain um, items, you can see there that uh, the cooling water system is, is really not suffering, uh, is not progressing well, it's suffering delay, whilst the boiler is, seems to be progressing okay. So again, you know, another indicator as to what might be critical on this project. Um, delay measurements, again, you know, we look at, it, just an example of, of all the types of information we look at. This is measuring um, activities, how many days of delay they're in. So the, the vertical axis on the left is showing us that the boiler was suffering significant delay in the first few months of the project. Then it seemed to have recovered and, and got back on track. And then again, the cooling water system is now suffering significant delay. So all of these pieces we pull together um, to start to build our kind of database of analysis. As, uh, as Ed was saying, EOT submissions, um, normally people put into writing what they think is causing delay and, and, and employers grant EOTs based on EOT submissions or don't grant EOTs depending on, on the substance of them. But again, it's, it's stuff that we use um, to start to piece together the whole of the project. <laughs> Um, so, so that's kind of the actual critical path and how we start to put it together. And as I've said there, it's, it's identifying the contenders. And what, on, a, on a major project, uh, or, or really on most projects, there's going to be contenders. There's going to be various sequences of activities that may be critical. And we look at all these contenders and start to pull together out of all of them at any point in time, which sequence was the driver of, of, um, of delay. And that's when we get into our delay analysis um, exercise. And I've, I've, I've extracted a table here from the SEL, um, which some of you may be familiar with, but that gives us the kind of standard types of analysis that uh, are used by, by either on live jobs or by delay um, experts uh, after a job is finished. The first one impacted as planned, and I'm going to run through quickly some examples of how we use each of these. Uh, time impact analysis, time slice windows analysis, as planned be as built windows analysis, um, retrospective longest path, and then collapse as built. And, and we tend to see all of these types of analysis at, at, at any point in time, um, and on disputes you may come across uh, either 
on your own project, you may use one of these types of analysis, or you may see the other side using one of these types of analysis. And I think the caveat here is, um, from my point of view, it's really, uh, there's no one size fits all, but the, the method that seeks to try and put you back in place of that project at that time, so contemporaneously uh, identifying the critical path, is, is really the one that tells you well, what was happening at the time. And I've just, I've just put two quotes down there. And the first one is from um, a case in New South Wales in, in Australia, where it, 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 it's an interesting case because what happened was two delay experts uh, used two different types of delay analysis um, to identify critical delay to the project. Um, the judge found neither of them to be particularly helpful. Um, so he engaged his own delay expert to assist him with understanding what um, what uh, actually delayed the project. And the quote is, you know, paying close attention to the fact um, as to what was actually delaying the project. So, so some of the types of analysis can be theoretical in nature, but the overriding view from, from you know, lots of case law, um, arbitrators, uh, tribunals, um, and really the SCL protocol, as it says there, you know, the overriding objective is to arrive at a conclusion that's derived from sound, uh, from a sound common sense perspective. So if it's, for, you know, if it's a 50 story tower that's being constructed, um, to say that the, the fence around um, the car park outside was critically driving the project is, it seems to be unlikely to, to, to get to the common sense, pass the common sense test. And for us, whenever we do any sort of analysis, you always have to sit back and say, does this actually, you know, does this actually make sense? Um, you know, does it, does it pass the common sense test? So just running through um, the types of analysis, I'll start with impacted as planned, which is probably um, one of the simplest forms of analysis. So you, you establish a baseline program as we, as we saw earlier in my slides. Uh, and then you simply input the delay event and you measure, you reschedule the program and you measure uh, the impact of that delay event into, uh, as you can see, the completion date of the project has moved. Um, very simple type of analysis. It requires a logic link program because it's acting, um, it, it's acting from a logic based uh, approach where you input an activity or delay event and you reschedule um, the determination of the likely duration of the delay event so it can be modeled reasons to perform this um, insufficient as built information so you don't you're not really looking what actually happened uh, you're just taking one delay event and modeling it into the project and it's a relatively straightforward um, uh, event that occurred near to the commencement of the project i.e. maybe delay to site, site access is a good, good example. Common problems with this analysis is, um, as I said there, it requires a, a logic link baseline program because it's a dynamic type of analysis. It's a prospective determination. So it's saying this delay event will cause um, a delay of X, whilst later on other issues may have caused greater delay. Um, I've said it's biased towards the party who's who, whose interests lie in maximizing the delay event. So the party is going to input a selected delay event and come up with a selected um, um, uh, position on delay. So it, so it can be seen as one-sided. Um, it doesn't deal with concurrent delay. Um, it doesn't really deal with a contemporaneous critical path. And as I said there, it takes no, no account of actual progress, actual resources, how the logic may have changed on the program or on the project as the project evolves. So, so it is probably the most simple form. Um, if I see that as a delay expert um, from, say, from, from a, a party that I'm either look, you know, acting with or against, it really is checking that against what actually happened, what contemporaneously happened on the project. Uh, if we take a step further, um, time impact analysis is a, a more advanced version of, of um, um, 
uh, impacted as planned. Again, we start with a baseline program, logic link baseline program, but this time we take we do we do account for progress at the point of time the event occurred. So we update the project and the program to take account of the status of the works at that time, and then we reschedule and check once we've inputted the delay event, we reschedule it and check um, for the movement of the completion date. And again, that shows us our entitlement. So it's a more advanced, um, a more advanced uh, way of analysis because it is actually trying to put you in that position when the event occurred on site. Um, again, looking at what we need for this type of, of program, we need a, a logic link program. We do need progress data, which we didn't need on the previous um, example because we're bringing progress up to date at the uh, time the event occurs. And again, we need to input the likely duration of the delay event so it can be modeled. Uh, reasons to perform this type of analysis. Um, it works on live, it has to work on live projects because what you're doing is saying, you've just given me a change or there's been a, an issue, a variation. I'm going to model that into my, into my program and I'm going to show you the effect of that. And that really is from, from a, contractual point of view, the NEC form of, con of, of contract uh, specifies this type of analysis. You're trying to resolve things on a live project um, as the works are undertaken, and therefore it, you know, it, it makes sense that this, this analysis should be followed. Common problems with this analysis, um, again, it, re it, relies a base it relies on a baseline program in its native format, so it can be modelled. Um, it's it's doing a, a prospective determination of the effect of the event. So maybe under an NEC type of project, you're looking at um, a 10 week, you, you say this is going to cause me 10 weeks of delay. I'm going to model 10 weeks of delay. In the end, it may be a 20 week event. It may be a five week event. Um, and again, it only, it only considers delay events that have been um, put into the program uh, and therefore um, it can be seen as slightly one-sided. As planned, we had built method of analysis. Um, this is, a, again, a step further. We have a baseline program that we use as a static benchmark to measure our as-built program against. Um, and then we, we work out our as-built program from all of the information I was talking about earlier. We take all of the pieces of information and build an as-built. And then we split, we work out our as built critical path. As I said, we look at all the sequences and we analyze what occurred on the project to identify our critical path. We then break it down into a series of windows and we measure the delay in each window. So, as you can see there, um, window one, when we measure back against our baseline, we're on track. Similarly, with window two, we're on track. Window three, we've now lost five days. And we would investigate why we've lost five days. Window four, we've now we've lost another 10 days, so we're 15 days behind. And by the end of the project, we're 25 days behind. So this is um, you know, the most robust form of analysis. It's you're stepping your way through the project, you're working out what was critical at the time, you're working out the delay that occurred at the time, and then you're invest investigating that critical delay. Um, so reasons to use this, it requires a baseline program, but it's, we're not doing a dynamic analysis. So the, the logic link is less important. It just is used as a benchmark and as built program and as built information. So you can understand what actually happened. All of those things I spoke about are the types, types of information we need. Uh, reasons to perform this type of analysis. Um, Program updates are few and far between or unreasonable. Um, it's, it, it's retrospective, but it's considering the critical path contemporaneously. So it's taking us back to that project and saying, this is what happened at this point in time. Common problems with this type of analysis. Um, the baseline program has to be reasonable. Um, the, the analysis supporting the critical path has to be robust and project records have to be adequate. If you've got inadequate progress records, you're gonna find it quite hard to do an as planned, be as built, Windows analysis. On a big project, it can also be 
time consuming and expensive to undertake. But it is, in, you know, in my view, the most robust form of analysis. Takeaway points. As I said there, it's the most successful is probably the as planned, be as built. It answers that factual question of what was planned to happen versus what actually happened, what actually happened on this project. And as I said there, the NEC is probably the exception that if an NEC project is being administered correctly, then you do a time impact analysis and you work out the, the delay contemporaneously and it's resolved and you move on and disputes are minimalized uh, in, in a perfect world. Uh, the most contentious delay issue uh, is the expert's opinion on the critical part. So that's where we kind of come up to. Um, we're looking at all of this data and we're coming up with an opinion of what was actually driving criticality. Um, it's document intensive and you need to consider all progress records. Uh, as I've said there, uh, the availability of documentation is going, to, is going to limit what can be done. Uh, it's based on facts. I'm just slightly conscious of the time uh, available to carry on, so I'm going to, I'm going to move quickly forward. Um, so we can, we can answer a couple of questions at the end, but really it's, it was really just to give you a, 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 an understanding of the different types of analysis that are used and, and the pros and cons of each. Um, concurrency, sequential delay, pacing, delay events and float. I'm going to quickly flick through these slides. Um, concurrency, Ed spoke about. Um, I'm going to give you just some examples to put it into some context. Both events must delay activities on the critical path. Um, both delay events must coincide or overlap. One party is liable for one event and the other party is responsible for the other. So just to put that into some graphics, um, I will show you just to just to um, show you what I mean. And John John Marin QC, although now KC, um, says a concurrent delay can be defined as a period of project overrun which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay, which are approximately equal in potency, which is very important potency between the two events. So just flicking through the examples. Here we have two delay events on the critical path, but they're not concurrent because they're happening at different times. Uh, two delay events, but it's not concurrent because one of them is not causing critical delay. Uh, delay events both happening at the same time, both causing critical delay, so therefore that's what we would call concurrent delay. And then secondly, um, delay events that have an overlap so at a point in time, they are both actually causing critical delay. One starts earlier, one finishes later, but there is a period where they both cause critical delay. So they are concurrent delays. Uh, sequential delay is when we look at just basically breaking down the project into uh, the order of delays. So and sequential delays should be dealt with in the order that they occur. So a delay event occurs, we deal with it, we look at the effect of it on the project, and then we move on to the next delay event. Um, and as we see there, there's a delay event analyzed on the critical path. That was the um, employer delay event. And then later on, a contractor delay event occurs, and we analyze that one um, sequentially. Pacing delay, I'm just gonna very quickly uh, touch on pacing. That's when a contractor consciously decides to slow the program down or to slow progress down on a on a project um i am conscious stacy do we do we want to take questions you think conscious that there's only five minutes left i, I think it'd be great if we could take a couple of questions from the audience that would that would be fantastic if you're nearly there okay um i think i will just quickly jump to the end apologies Float, um, Ed spoke about float. I won't go through the examples on that. Um, total, the difference between total float and free float. Uh, the slides are being shared afterwards, but these are very self explanatory um, as to the difference between total float and free float. And then I think 
uh, that is the end. So apologies that the last two subjects were, were jumped through, but the slides are available and I'm available as well. Absolutely. Um, Edward, David, thank you very much. I know it was a lot to get through in an hour, but everyone rest assured the slides will be available and please do feel re to reach out to either Edward or David. Um, I know we had a lot of fantastic questions coming in throughout uh, the presentation and um, we're clearly not going to be able to, to get to them, but I certainly will pass them on to David and Edward and they can uh, equally reach out to you as well. Um, but you know, thank you again for the last 15 minutes. It's the delay on projects is you know clearly can invoke quite a complicated area of law, a complicated set of facts or allegations which need to be analysed. And David passed the common sense test, of course. Um, and we really appreciate um, your clear and comprehensive run through of everything for us. Now I, we do have time. I think maybe like two or three questions. So. Possibly slightly controversial, David, but if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to choose this one. Um, why do we need delay experts? Why can't we just use factual witnesses uh, to provide the evidence in a dispute? Great okay, question. That's, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll say a couple of things and then I think Ed will probably have a couple of things to say as well. Um, from, from my point of view, what, what I do is I, you know, I or any other delay expert does a a truly independent um, forensic analysis of the project. Um, if you've got two sets of factual witnesses, one from the contractor, one from the employer, um, they may be slightly tainted by what occurred on the project. Uh, they may not fully remember what occurred on the project, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. And as an independent, we come through, and as I said, we look at all of the data, all of the facts, and we piece together to assist, our, our main job is to assist the tribunal or assist the judge on what actually happened on the project. You know, from a, from a completely independent person, step our way through and break down to help all parties understand what was actually driving critical delay, non-critical delay disruption at any point in time. And I, I think it's a really important role. Um, and it's a role that, that needs to be, you know, an independent person needs to undertake. Uh, Ed, if, you, if you've got something to add. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I, I think, I think um, quite, quite aside from the, the independence point, which I think is really important, I, I just think that there are problems with a, um, you know, a, a, a claimant may think, well, why, why can't my own a planner tell, tell the tribunal what was going on? Why can't my witnesses tell the tribunal how much delay was caused? I think, as David said, you're, you're often talking about issues that happened many years ago, and you're talking about issues that people are emotionally invested in. And they, they you know, they, I, I think you often find that um, when you when you speak to people who worked on projects and when you're, you're thinking about preparing a delay claim that they are very focused on certain issues which understandably at the time that they, they were doing the works were, were a real concern for them but actually you know they may not be the real causes of delay and also there are so many of them so many issues and and what what an expert does is it allows you to really focus your case on the issues that, that matter so that that really then directs your your evidence to, to the key points and obviously your, your legal submissions even more so to, to, the, to the to the key points of well there were many issues on this project but what, what are the what are the things that really matter and on, only an independent expert can do that and as, as David says they, they have a duty to assist the tribunal so um, the, the, the tribunal or, or, or court so so that the tribunal or court can really re rely on what, what those conclusions are where, whereas clearly the um, the the claimants team ha have their own interest or, or the defendants team have their own interest in um, presenting their case it would it would leave an enormous amount for for a court or arbitrator to do if they didn't have an independent report. Great, thank you both. Um, next question. Um, when, in your opinion, is the right time to engage an expert or is there a wrong time? Um, 
Should I go first? <laughs> sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 from my point of view, um, you know, and I, I do get the phone call saying, we've issued our statement of claim, uh, we've issued our witness statements, um, we, need a, we need an expert report, have you got a spare two weeks to, to put something together? Um, that's definitely the wrong time and, and far too late, um, and we can't really add much value um, at that point in time, although you'd be surprised how often we get, we get asked to. Um, from my point of view, it, it, it's as early as possible. If you, if you feel that you've got um, a, a, a dispute, bring someone in, I, you know, totally independent, have a look at what the issues are. Um, it really helps you with your strategy. It helps you understand, um, you know, again, what, what's critical, what's not critical. Um, and it, it, the earlier, the, the better for me, because then I can really um, assist with, with um, you know, resolving the dispute. Um, and, and help resolve it maybe before it even gets to dis, uh, formal dispute or litigation by giving that kind of independent view on what's actually happened. Um, so I'm, I'm an early as possible type of person. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's right, that the earlier uh, an expert's on board, the earlier you can have clarity as to exactly how you're going to formulate your claim. I think the, the only sort of caveat to that is um, in, in court and arbitration proceedings, a e expert has, to, particularly in court proceedings, has to act as an expert evidence. You can only have one expert which you, who you have to put forward and sign a part 36 um, declaration that you, you owe your duties to the court. So it, it, there's just, a, I think, an important distinction between acting as a expert advisor where you are advising on the preparation of a claim and um, acting as a witness in expert witness in, in proceedings so um, I think you can give sort of general advice about steps that can be taken to prepare a claim but you shouldn't you also shouldn't be too actively involved in the actual preparation of the claim because that may, may tarnish your independence later on yeah yeah totally agree fantastic thank you both um we i think we're gonna have time for one more question a huge amount of questions have come in and they're, they're very detailed and excellent questions so we'll definitely reach out to you um afterwards thank you very much for su submitting them but i think this question um to sort of wrap up and and, and look to the future of of delay analysis if we can um david we've ha had a question on how concerned are you that the possibility of artificial intelligence uh, might might steal your role, might steal the credibility, or or or, or what? Do you have any have any thoughts on the future of delay, delay analysis and artificial intelligence? Um, yeah, so so AI is is talk of the town, obviously. Um, I I don't think it's going to replace us just yet. I think AI is going to be, and and we're starting to use. Um, AI tools here in our office. It's, it, it's a great way of managing huge amounts of data and, and, and investigating data. But I don't think, uh, we're, we're not at the point in time where you can type into chat GBT, what was the critical path? And it will, it will give you an answer, it will give you an opinion, because all it's doing is, is using data that it can find. It can't do that, sit back and compare um, and really do a do an independent opinion of of what it's looking at. It, it's it's a great tool, and as I said, we're using it. But I think um, it's not going to be just yet relied upon to give to give opinion. Whether it will ever give opinion from a technical point of view, I'm not sure. But it but it's here to stay, and it's it, and as I said, we're using it um, <laughs> amazingly well now to help us. No, absolutely, very powerful tool. It's it's not sort of an if, it's it's a when, isn't it? And I think, I mean, as as we're seeing some of the the false the false informations or the hallucinations or the uh, I don't know if anyone's seen the the recent news where um, there were lawyers uh, in the U.S. who were asking questions and it generated false uh, citations, yeah. false case names. Yeah. Obviously. Um, if you you know if you are using it, you definitely need to apply the uh, sense check. It's not common sense check test to to the outcome of any um, use of AI. I, I mean, I could, 
I can I can see how it could be and, and will be really useful for um, assisting assisting an expert with with the process of reviewing documents. But but ultimately, I think that um, the part so the, the the expert has to help the tribunal and it, it you know, explaining why things why 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 conclusions have been reached I'm, I'm maybe i'm underestimating i a i but i i think that that sort of ability to communicate is is really important and that's what the best experts can do i explain to a court or a tribunal why they've reached conclusions and that you know gives a, a court or a tribunal confidence that that they're correct um I, I can't quite imagine ai doing doing that but yeah we shall i hopefully i'll get to retirement but uh yeah we we, we shall see yeah it definitely watch this space a very rapidly evolving space it is so so there we are but i think we've come to the end of our um session for today uh thank you very much edward and david again for 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 the last hour um and all i have left to do is to if i may market our upcoming next webinar which will take place in september we have another of our adjudication updates. Uh, for those of you who join us regularly, you will recognize Adele Parsons of Fenwick Elliott and Barrister Daniel Churcher of Four Pump Court. So there is a QR code there on the slide if you would like to uh, register for that now. And with that, thank you very much again, David and Edward, and thank you very much to the audience for joining us again today. We very much hope you will we will see you on a future webinar and Hope you are well and keep safe wherever you might be. Thank you again, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you.